Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. I thought I'd show you my card in case you want to get in touch with me. Um, you can see that the one that says Lonnie Gail Clark at Gmail, which you find me on Chrome, is really for school. I hardly ever look at anything that's personal or even the social thing there. So if you want to get in touch with me, contact me at Nuts for Art. That's my phone number. So I'm going to finish reading not finish reading because it's a long chapter, but I'm going to continue reading where we left off at page 68. And I think I'm going to read the last chapter so that we remember I stopped right at the very bottom. OK, and um, I'm going to keep going more on chapter five, lip service to the public health, page 68, under the subtitle of the situation up to the present. In 1964, the plowshare program dedicated to the development and utilization of nuclear explosives for peaceful purposes, held a symposium at the University of California at Davis. Oh, I don't think I showed you guys the book. So that's the book. I always want to show it to you now so that you can take a look at it for yourself and find it. <clears throat> okay. Let's go back to that first sentence. Kaufman was asked to present a paper on the, quote, the hazards to man from radioactivity. Unquote. By then, the biomedical program had been underway a year. That paper was presented, and it stated that we knew far too little about the hazards of radioactivity to comment on the loss of lives in this generation or future generations from the spewing of radioactivity that would necessarily accompany such projects as digging an interoceanic canal, a sea level type like Panama Canal by the use of nuclear explosives. <clears throat> and further, that the favorite cliché of, of the atomic energy promoters, namely that, quote, benefits to be achieved outweigh the risks, unquote, was meaningless, since no evidence had been adduced concerning the benefits, and tremendous gaps existed in our knowledge as to the true risks. Plowshare advocates at the Lawrence Laboratory itself were furious about that presentation. Lawrence Lab was a, lead, was a leading advocate of Plowshare, largely sponsored by Dr. Edward Teller, and almost the only technical center actively engaged in it. And here was a member of the same laboratory's biomedical program and an associate director of the laboratory at that saying that our knowledge was far too fragmentary to provide a biomedical endorsement of the safety of that program. Et tu, Brute? This guy's funny. <clears throat> you can tell he went to college, eh? Indeed. The next day, one of the leading exponents of Plowshare reported to Dr. Foster, the laboratory director, that the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory had a, quote, Trojan horse, unquote, in its midst. He told Dr. Goffman about this laughingly. It is clear in retrospect that failure to whitewash nuclear programs with retrospect to health and safety is certainly no way to win friends and influence people within the AEC family, quote, unquote. But that presentation of the, quote, hazards to man from radioactivity, unquote, did accomplish one major goal, namely proving that an honest evaluation was not totally impossible from an AEC-sponsored laboratory. Indeed, the highly respected Committee for Environmental Information in St. Louis, Missouri, requested permission to reprint the hazards to man from radioactivity in its journal entitled Scientist and Citizen. I wonder if it's, that is still in print. As everyone actively following this field knows, the St. Louis group has performed a superb service over many years in bringing to public attention the truth concerning radioactivity, radioactive fallout, and their hazards in living creatures. For scientists and citizens to have carried that presentation is indeed a distinction, indicating credibility of the responsible concerned scientists of which there's practically zero anymore. Next subchapter. Peaceful atomic explosions will spew radioactive poisons. 
While we don't, while we didn't know the precise magnitude of the loss in lives and human suffering to be anticipated from a plowshare program, such as digging a Panama Canal more than a hundred megatons with more than a hundred megatons of nuclear bombs, we certainly did know that the magnitude could theoretically range from a low number to some enormous cost in human lives. Such nuclear explosions for peaceful purposes represent uncontrolled spewing and dissemination of a variety of radioactive poisons in great quantities over lands and waters. They're to be accumulated by plants, animals, and man. Reflecting on this now, we realize we should, we should not only have, excuse me, reflecting upon this now, we realize we should not only have said that the hazards are unknown, but we also should have said that it represents utter folly to consider such projects precisely because the hazard to life could potentially be extremely large. In fact, Duane Sewell, an associate director at Lawrence, Liver, at Lawrence Lab, asked Goffman at one of the director's meetings what he thought by, about what he thought biologically about constructing a new Panama Canal by nuclear explosives by the year 1975. The reply was biological insanity. That's more true now than ever. And that's what we've got, biological insanity. We should, we should get a bumper sticker made up that says nuclear equal sign, biological insanity. That's a good idea. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Tamlin had organized a group to carry through one of the major tasks the new biomedical program had set for itself. Namely, predicting over space and time a dosage of radioactivity and radiation to be expected from any particular nuclear project, explosive or other, for people at various distances from the site of the project. Experience from the nuclear weapons testing in the 1950s and the early 1960s had provided abundant evidence that winds can carry radioactive debris from nuclear explosions thousands of miles from the site of the explosion. Hence, it is evident that a responsible evaluation of the dosage to be expected for humans must be global in scope and must address itself to consideration of every conceivable radioactive substance that could be released from, say, a nuclear detonation. Since this involves some 700 possible radioactive substances of varying lifetimes of existence and having widely different properties concerning meteorological distribution and concentration in various members of man's food web, the enormity of the task is readily appreciated. But steady, effective progress in this large endeavor was being made by Tamplin and his Information Integration Group, capital I, capital I, capital G, Information Integration Group. Again, the atomic energy promotional philosophy raised its ugly head in criticizing the Tamplin approach. We must understand this program. Pro I'm sorry, we must understand this problem. The Taplin approach was to consider the, that health and safety of the public as paramount and the promotional aspects of the nuclear project as irrelevant by comparison. After all, there is never a dearth of hoopla and promotional ballyhoo emanating endlessly from technological promoters, such as the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. And to consider the health and safety of the public as the prime obligation, it is essential to be conservative in estimates of what might happen in the project. For what might happen under adverse meteorologic conditions, such as rainstorm in intersecting a radioactive cloud, could lead to massively higher doses of radiation and radioactivity accumulation by people than the promoter's estimates assuming everything would go off perfectly with their, in accord with their hopes. I want to read that again so that we really get that because that is a really interesting statement. 
for what might, and might is in italics, happen under adverse meteorologic conditions, such as, a, such as a rainstorm intersecting a radioactive cloud, could lead to massively higher doses of radiation and radioactivity accumulation by people, by people than the promoter's estimates. Assuming every who assume everything could go up perfectly in accord with their hopes. The Information Integration Group expressed its philosophy well in the preface to the many scientific reports on this subject in the following. I'm on page 71, and I'm going to stop there because I'm at 10 minutes, and I kind of think that's long. Um, because there, this goes on for a little while. And it goes on to here. And so I'll be reading for two or three minutes. I think I'll stop. Uh, I'll pick this up on page 71, and we'll pick it up at the bottom. Uh, the Information Integration Group expressed its philosophy well in the preface to the many scientific reports on this subject in the following. I'll pick that up tomorrow night. So I um, appreciate all of you guys uh, reading this information with me. And I really appreciate your support and encouragement. It's really nice of you and very kind of you. I can't really be objective. I have no idea what it sounds like. But um, I'm actually dumbfounded that we really do have a philosophy deep inside our government to just ignore what harms people because it makes money. And that, that kind of goes against everything that I think of as being an American, to be honest. And um, the good thing is, is I am an American, and I'm going to keep getting back up, and I'm going to fight for our country in a peaceful way, and in a way that's lawful, and in a way that changes hearts and minds so that people will actually decide for themselves, so that our elected officials would decide for themselves that they don't need to take the money of the Koch brothers or General Electric. And then once they stop taking their money, then we can prosecute the criminals because, uh, uh, you know, or, or they can't come into our country, exclude them. So anyways, I'm sorry to be grim tonight, but it's really heavy on my heart. Like the, It's a crime against humanity what the nuclear industry is doing and has done. And it's not something to be soft-spoken about. And I'm, you know, I guess I am soft-spoken, but I could be screaming and yelling. It's, I mean, I guess we all feel this way. There's really not much any of us can do about it. But that's not true. Every drop counts. That's why I'm here reading this book every night. That's why I'm going to keep speaking out. And I'm actually going to be, I, I think I need to do another protest. I think I need to find some place to just stand out and make people uncomfortable for their complicity, their silent complicity. So, ciao, you guys. I'll talk to you tomorrow night. I'll read a few more pages tomorrow. Bye.